say that you're going to, you know, make a woman fall in love with you in order to, to prostitute her and then to, to kill her and send her body back to the original owner, uh, that's very troubling and, and very, very tragic when our kids are getting a constant dose of this. I'm going to play this video for you real quick. This is a student's response to Lil Wayne's song, uh, Every Girl. This was made, I believe, in 2009. And... Uh, she makes some interesting points as a young woman. So we're going to see if this will play for us, and then we'll continue on. Sorry for the bus ring. We're going to try to let that bus a little bit, and then we'll come back to that. But you got a chance to hear uh, some of the exact lyrics and the exact words uh, of the artist, Little Wayne, and we see how it's very troubling. It's very troubling. Now, another question that I want to encounter, another objection is, well, why pick Little Wayne? You know, there's a lot of other artists who are saying a lot of different things, a lot of, a lot of things that are negative and bad. So people have asked me, you know, why did you pick him? Many people think that I'm just trying to profit off of him because he's just the number one artist or something like that. Well, the reason that I chose Little Wayne uh, is because there's no other artist that is the main proponent of this philosophy uh, like he is. And I like to, people who ask that question, well, you know, why'd you pick him? Are you just trying to profit off of him because he's the number one rapper? And I propose this question to you. Can you tell me another artist uh, who says that you should prostitute a woman, uh, kill her, and send her body back to the original owner? Can you tell me another artist that says that? Or can you tell me another artist who, in, in his song, says that he is God and his album is the New Testament? Can you tell me that? Or can you tell me an artist that mentions a 16-year-old girl's name in, the song, in a song and reference the possible sex with her? Uh, can you tell me another black artist that does these things and that is having the impact that he has? Uh, I don't think so. And therefore, he, again, number one, is the main proponent of this philosophy, and he is the main aggregate of this philosophy. He's the one who is spreading it. He is the one that is putting a picture on it. And he is the one that is doing the most damage to urban, to urban youth because of this type of philosophy. I believe that our video is buffered a little bit, so we're going to go back to uh, the response. Is more the, the lyrics in this song, I wish I could, every girl in the world, is just totally disrespectful. I love this song off the radio because it degrades women and it's inappropriate for our youth to listen to. People may say it's the clean version, but I don't know how clean a song can get by bleeping out the F word or replacing it with the word love. We are not ignorant, and we realize the meaning of the song. Now you may ask, 
one of this particular song when there are other songs like Birthday Sex and Boyfriend Number Two. But this really hit home for me when they said every girl. I took it literally and felt that it was a personal and direct insult. He even mentions it in the song, Every College Girl. Now I have four younger sisters and I am the oldest. The lyrics in the song also say, in about three years, I'll have me Miley Cyrus. So she makes some good points, and she goes on even further uh, to make some good points. And this is a college student who is saying these things. Uh, you know, for a song like that, you know, I wish I could, you know, F every girl in the world. I ask the question, you know, is there an age limit, you know, for these girls? Uh, is there an age limit? And, you know, if you have men and, and young urban teens who are following this music and philosophy and this artist, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow what he says. And if you study, there has been a tragic rise in sexual assault uh, of gang rape in the last five years. And I'll just try to go down uh, in, in the story on, on the website. You can see this, Women in Danger. It says the young urban female is in danger of losing her very identity of what it means to be a woman. The more objectified a woman becomes, the more at risk she is in losing her very womanhood. Take into account the unprecedented numbers of gang rapes that have been perpetrated among teenage and urban girls in the last five years. In 2009, Richmond, California witnessed one of the most heinous crimes ever in their history when investigators say at least 20 people were involved and watched the gang rape of a 15-year-old. The worst thing about that was that during the two-and-a-half-hour ordeal, not one person sought to intervene. Going down a little bit further, April 2010, a 15-year-old went to a house party in which she allowed men to have sex with her for money. Her seven-year-old sister followed her. She decided that she could make some more money by allowing the men to touch her sister, which quickly, in quickly turned into a, a rape, a gang rape of the seven-year-old child. In March of 2011, Cleveland, Texas, there were an 11-year-old girl who was raped by 18 black men, raided from the ages of 16 to 28. Now, just looking at these things, it's very disturbing, it's very troubling as we think about this. But again, when you have an artist who is promoting this philosophy where there is no right and no wrong, therefore you're going to see things like this. So as a pastor, as a Christian, as a man who is observing these things, it's my desire uh, that we see change, that we see someone call these things out so that uh, more people won't have to suffer. Now, just going on a little bit further, I'm going to just kind of give a little brief overview of the book. Uh, here's an a e-copy here. I kind of want to help you, help us see some of the chapters and kind of what I talk about in each chapter of the book. Let me scroll down just a little bit. Let's see. Here we go. I kind of want to break down each chapter in the book. The first chapter is called The, the Weezy Phenomenon. And uh, in this chapter, I'm just really giving a brief bi uh, a bio, his rise to fame. I'm also giving some interesting facts that many people don't know uh, about Little Wayne. You know, I'm not, I, as, a, as a pastor, it's very easy just kind of to focus on the spiritual level, but there's also some psychological and social issues in the book. Many people don't know that Little Wayne, he suffered uh, sexual abuse when he was 12 years old. And I show how that in some ways relates to some of the music he's recording. Uh, so the Weezy Phenomenon is really a biography of Little Wayne. Second chapter, Passing the Torch, this shows kind of his rise to fame, how, remember, Little Wayne was kind of a, you know, a, a known rapper, but not in the upper echelon of rappers. Chapter two called The Passing of the Torch, it talks about how he began to rise to fame from his first Carter album to the Carter Three, which would go on to sell a million copies in its first week. Chapter 3, The Bath House of Rap, I talk about the Carter Three, and uh, I make the proposition that this was the greatest moral influence on urban youth of the 21st century. When he released that album, something happened, and people had no idea what was happening. And I go into the album, I break down the lyrics even more to show you some of the disturbing things that he talks about and how he's just slowly beginning to inject and to embed these things into youth and doing it in such a way where they're laughing to it, they're dancing to it, and not recognizing that they're being influenced by this type of philosophy. A chapter four called Media 
and pop culture, the modern blackface. And if you do have time later on, I want to encourage you to check out the website because we actually we posted an excerpt of this chapter uh, in the book. Let me see if I can just take you there for one quick second. It's a chapter about media and pop culture, and I show that much of Little Wayne's popularity and success is not simply related to his ability to, to weave uh, rhyme schemes together, but it is a reflection on media's fascination with racism. Uh, Little Wayne, in the eyes of America, I believe, corporate America, is their modern day, and I, I want to be careful how I use these words, so please understand me. Please understand me. I don't use this terminology uh, for fun, and I only use it to make a point. But I believe that in corporate America, Little Wayne is their newest blackface nigger. And if you understand, you know, the history of blackface and the minstrels, you know that during the, the time right after slavery, abolition, you knew that there was a type of theatrical play in which white artists would paint their faces black and portray some of the stereotypes of black people. Uh, as you see, Daddy Rice, I was one of the main artists, but some of the actors, Fred Astaire, Mickey Rooney, and Judy Garland, they performed in blackface. And it was a caricature, a caricature of the black and African American. You know, things like this, where they would paint their face black and sing these weird songs in order to, to really make blacks look ignorant, to make us look stereotypical. And, uh, you know, here's a picture of 2009. It was the Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. She got into a little bit of hot water because she went to a Halloween party in blackface uh, portrayed as Little Wayne. And I think this picture is important because it kind of shows, you know, what white America really think about, you know, an artist like Little Wayne or what they are beginning to, in, or to think about blacks. I mean, when, when a white person bobs their head to Little Wayne, when they're suburban, they love Little Wayne, but when they have to work with an African-American artist, are they really projecting those stereotypes, you know, uh, on that hard-working African-American because they believe that a black person is really like Lil Wayne uh, at the core. So the chapter, uh, Blackface, uh, the modern blackface, it talks about that, goes a little bit further in understanding the concept of Lil Wayne's appeal to modern culture in corporate America. Number five, the chapter of the urban female, we spoke a little bit about that. It shows the effect, the greatest effect that uh, Lil Wayne's music is having upon urban women, urban generation females. And I really give a lot of stats, a lot of information in this chapter, and I hope that people really take the time to look at it because it is really staggering. There's a great amount of evidence that's showing uh, that, you know, urban females are really, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, people would say, you know, the, the black male is an endangered species. Well, I dare say that the urban female in this generation, she's an endangered species. So I talk about the effect of the music on the urban female. Chapter 6 is a, is a real good chapter that talks about the – sociology, psychology behind hip-hop, about how to interpret hip-hop. And I know that, you know, many ministers have different views about how to interpret hip-hop. Uh, X Ministries has been one who in kind of demonized hip-hop. And I want to say with X Ministries, I think, you know, by and large, I think they do a good job of addressing the spiritual nature of, of, some, of some of the common themes behind hip-hop. But I think in a sense that there's a point where they miss the bigger picture. Because all culture is an expression of a need. And that need, ultimately, no matter how it begins to manifest itself, it's a need for God. And so what I seek to interpret in this chapter is how hip-hop is really in the music and the message of, of the roots of hip-hop, how it started. It really began as a cry out to God, and it has evolved into something that is completely contrary and against God. Chapter 7. Rap music influence. I talk about the power of words a little bit further. I show some uh, psychological effects of words and how words are so powerful. Chapter 8, this is where I begin to get a little bit more spiritual and focus on that. I show that there is a demonic and a occult influence uh, of the music of Little Wayne. And as you see, I've waited to do that. I kind of I, I section each, each section of the book to kind of go progressively. We start off with biography, and then we go into the spiritual aspects. Again, it's not just simply... Here's the spiritual truth. Take it or leave it. I work, I work through the book to kind of show the building evidence. And yes, I do believe that there is strong demonic and occultic influence in the life of Little Wayne and also through his music. And I go a great length and great detail to show that. Uh, number nine, the expected conclusion of Little Wayne. 
Now, many people here you know, may say, well, how can you show the expected conclusion of little Wayne? Do you, do you know his future? In a sense, you know, the Bible gives the future of every person. You know, the Bible says it's appointed for a person to die and after that the judgment. The question is what judgment are you going to face? Uh, so based upon past rappers of his stature, past rappers with his ability, I seek to show that what's the logical conclusion for an artist like Little Wayne apart from divine intervention. And then number chapter 10 is a chapter that seeks to encourage and to speak to parents, Christian leaders, and to youth uh, about the music of Little Wayne. So I hope that everyone can, can get some time to go through that. Briefly, I'll go through just kind of a, a brief uh, navigation of the website. I'll go through a brief navigation of the website. And uh, as you can see, the first page is the, the home page, which just kind of gives more information uh, about the book. And there's also a lot of porticos, which you can see here. If you just scroll over a picture, it'll get more information. Uh, this portico here, it gives more information about the book. Uh, there's a chat room for people who want to discuss this more. This is Dr. Boyce Watkins who began to address the, the influence and impact of Little Wayne. There's an article by him and also a video by him if anyone wants to check that out. This is a series of, of videos that we did. Uh, we did a, a music release uh, a party at our church when we began to tell and to instruct people about the music of Little Wayne. There's a set of videos here. So that's an opportunity to kind of get more information about the book. The main page about the book, you just kind of click on here, the book, and uh, it'll take you to a music review of the book. Uh, let's see. There we go. This music review is by uh, Mike Bologna. He's a music missiologist. And uh, I appreciate what he said. He's a very well-written, well-thought-out response to the international phenomenon that is Little Wayne. And one thing he makes a point, which I try to make the point, too, when I'm expressing a work like this, is that I am not condemning rap or hip-hop in general, only those specific negatives that come from artists like Lil Wayne and him as the main artist. And so I also point out, he makes reference to this, that hip-hop is quite the spiritual medium. I believe that uh, hip-hop, all culture is spiritual at their core. So therefore, uh, that's why uh, I address the book from that level. So again, you click on the book page to get some more information about it. Uh, there's also an article that thechristianpost.com did. You can check that out where they did an interview. Uh, this Buy Now page, and we are able to, to purchase the book directly from the publisher. There's a Facebook like page and also a chapter uh, summary, I'm sorry, a sample chapter that you can read that gives more information. also decided to put the sermon that I did uh, on this book page, so you're able to listen to the sermon uh, on this book page. Uh, the book is it's $9.99. Uh, there are e-copies that are also available that you can get immediately. Uh, they'll be sent to you for $5.99. And uh, also, if you are a pastor or a youth minister uh, or have any influence of, over youth in a, in a ministry capacity, for a limited time, we're offering the e-copies for free to you so that you can get accustomed and get acquainted with what the uh, this philosophy is, how to combat it, and how to address it. And as I get ready to conclude, I just want to kind of finish out with two things. Number one, I believe that Jesus Christ is the answer. Uh, again, Jesus Christ is the answer. Uh, our moral philosophy, it says that there is no such thing as right, no wrong. There is no authority. And in all actuality, this type of philosophy, it was really made popular by a famous Satan worshiper who, whose name was Aleister Crowley. And in Aleister Crowley's book called The Lima, or The Law, he says, there is no other law, do whatever you will. Do whatever you want. But we know that you know doing whatever you want will bring a great consequence, because doing whatever you want leads to sin and leads to unrighteousness. But it is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of heaven, the Lord of, Lord of earth. He is the one that men must give an account to. So if we think that we can do whatever we want without giving an account to him, we are deceived and we are ultimately going to be led astray. And so the need is to, to show that Christ is the true Lord of heaven and earth, that all men must face him. As that scripture states, it's appointed for man to die once and after this the judgment. You know, one thing that Little, Little Wayne says in this song is that, is that he is God. He makes that statement in the song, I am God. Well, you know, in the book of Psalms, 
there's a statement that says, uh, even though you are God, you will die like men. And God says that, not that men are gods, but if they try to live as our gods, ultimately they will die as men. And so we are seeing that there are some great moral and spiritual and social effects by men seeking to live their life as God. But Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is able to liberate anyone who is in bondage to this music. And my hope is that through this research, through this book, and through the scriptures that are contained in this book, that many young people will begin to be rescued and redeemed from the bondage of this type of philosophy and the spiritual slavery uh, that they have been, uh, been experiencing through this book. I also talk about some of the consequences of listening to attaining uh, a, a love for this type of music. Uh, there's some things that are pretty evident in the lives of teens when they begin to embrace this type of music. So this is what uh, I express in the book. And then finally, I want to make a call to action, a call to action. And this call to action is related, is directed toward parents, teens, and urban leaders. Listen, my call to action is this. Get familiar with this book. Understand what's being said. It's, it's rare that you're going to find a book probably that, that discusses not only Little Wayne but hip-hop and the, and the attraction on the social, psychological, and a spiritual level. Get familiar with this book. And I'm going to say, listen, buy this book for teens and for youth and host a book study at your house. I believe that this is one of the greatest ways that we can begin to make an impact on youth, is that if we ourselves take the initiative, one thing that's a temptation to do when, I, when, I, when a book like this comes out is just to talk about it and just make comments on it. No. We need to be willing to take a stand and say, you know, we want to address this issue. And therefore, I want to call, if, if you have a passion or a concern for urban youth, buy this book. Buy copies of it. Uh, get sponsored by your church and say, listen, we want to begin to hold a weekly book study at our house. And you can let people know. Let youth know in your neighborhood. Say, we're going to begin to study this book. You can, we'll give you a copy of the book. Uh, also accompanied with the book is a music soundtrack. You can download the music soundtrack for free and give them a copy of the music soundtrack. Begin to get familiar with the book and begin to host a study at your house teaching these things, uh, teaching the, the principles and the truths of this book to you. Uh, you know, par parents may not always do their job, but it may take someone who cares about the youth, someone who has an eye and a desire to see them, uh, you know, in a proper relationship with God and also with themselves to say, listen, we're going to begin to do this. So my encouragement is to get familiar with this book, number one, to buy it, uh, not for me, because the proceeds are going to you know, the church and to mercy ministry, but to buy it, uh, to buy copies of it, to host a, a youth book study at your house, to teach the principles of this book every week. And I believe that youth, they want to learn. They want to learn. The question is, what are they learning? And as they begin to learn some of these things, their eyes will begin to open up, and I begin. we can begin to see change in our urban youth. So I believe that book studies together with urban youth, because, you know, urban youth, a lot of them don't have money to buy this book. A lot of them, they're going to you know, kind of turn this book off just by, you know, under, maybe seeing some of the concept of it. But if leaders and, and parents begin to, you know, invite youth to their home to say, let's study this together, let's read this together, let's talk about this. Let's talk about why he is such a phenomenon, why people are so attracted to him. I believe that we'll begin to see change uh, slowly but surely as God begins to work in the heart and life of people. Well, again, thank you so much. My name is Jomo Johnson, the pastor for the Open Air Church. Feel free to contact me at jomo1980 at aol.com. Also, Twitter, Jomo K. Johnson. Uh, the website is deadisrapperalive.com. Feel free to browse and peruse the site. And uh, we'll just continue. I, I want to ask you just to continue to spread the word, continue to, to get the message out there. And uh, we will seek to, uh, to spread this message because we have a passion and a desire for youth, for urban youth of the generation. So thank you so much. I appreciate everyone who made the time to listen and to, and to, to call in. And uh, we're going to put this, uh, this video on YouTube so it will be a resource for you all later as well. Thank you again.